This presentation is delivered by the Stanford Center for Professional Development. Great. Oh, well, uh, starting on our next application topic, uh, which is uh, statistical estimation. So, last time we looked at estimation from a, I guess a, just a purely, uh, just sort of a, a, a simple fitting uh, point of view, approximation and fitting, and now we'll actually look at it from a, a statistical uh, point of view. Actually, it's interesting because it, you end up kind of with the same stuff, you just get a different, uh, different viewpoint. So, let me give the, the broad setting is actually just, a, it's just, well, it's just pure statistics. So, here is pure statistics. It's this, you have a probability density uh, that depends on a parameter. So that's, uh, that's pure statistics. And I guess our, our stat department, uh, uh, there we go, contingent. Oh, and their, their, their center, center front will keep, will, will keep me honest, or at least uh, object um, when, when needed. So in, a, in, a, in pure statistics, uh, there's just parameterized probability distributions. And we have a parameter uh, x, and your job, you, you sample, uh, well, you get one or more samples from uh, one of these distributions and your, your, your charge is to say something intelligent about which distribution, which is to say which parameter value generated the sample. So that's, uh, that's statistics. So uh, a standard technique uh, is maximum likelihood estimation. In maximum likelihood estimation, you do the following. You have an observation y and you look at the uh, density of the, you look at the density at y or probability distribution if it's if it's uh, if, it, if it's a distribution on like a, if it's got on on different points on on, on uh, uh, atomic points you look at this and you actually choose the parameter value x that maximizes this quantity that's the same as maximizing the uh, log likelihood we'll see actually why the log goes in there uh, the log goes in there for many many reasons. One is if you have independent samples, this splits into a sum. And the second is that many distributions are actually log concave, this time in the parameter. Now, in fact, last time, so far we've looked at distributions that are concave in the argument. This is concave actually in the parameter. And those are actually slightly different concepts. So we'll, we'll see this in examples. All right. So the log of the, I'll just call it a density, the log of the density as a function now of the parameter here, not uh, the, the argument here. This is called the log likelihood function. And in this problem, it, it's often the case, uh, for example, if some of the parameters involve things like variances or covariance matrices, or they're just parameters that are positive or something like that, if they represent rates or something, intensities, they're, they're clearly limited uh, in, in to, some, to some set. So you can add uh, to this problem either an explicit constraint, that part that x has to be in some set c, or another way to just affect the same thing is simply to define p uh, sub x of y to be 0 when x is outside the domain of, the, uh, the domain of, of p, at least the, the, uh, the parameter argument. And that, of course, makes the log minus infinity, and that makes it a very, very poor choice uh, if you're maximizing. So that's the same as just making the, the, the constraint uh, implicit. Okay. So these are very often convex optimization problems. By the way, they are sometimes not. Um, if you do machine learning or statistics, you'll kind of start, a, you'll get a feel for when they're not. Uh, typical examples would be missing the most obvious and common examples missing data. Um, but we'll, we'll see some examples and we'll focus on the cases where it is. So this is often a convex optimization problem. And remember, the, the variable here is x, which is, a set, which is a parameter in the distribution. y here actually is a, <clears throat> a sample. It's an observed sample. OK. Let's look at uh, some examples. Uh, the first is just linear measurements with IID noise. So here, here's what you have. Uh, you have a bunch of measurements, so you have yi is ai transpose x plus vi. Um, 
Here, uh, x is the, the set of parameters that you want to estimate. Uh, but I guess if you're a statistician, you would say the following. You would say that the data yi are generated by uh, a distribution. The distribution is parameterized by x. Okay, So that's what it is. And the way it's parameterized is this way. And in fact, x only affects, as you can see, the mean of the distribution. It doesn't affect, for example, the variance. But that doesn't have to be the case. So, I mean, the way a normal person would say this is x is a set of parameter values that you want to estimate. But th this is fine. The, the, the correct, the conceptual way to say this is, this is, is you have a, dist is y is generated from a distribution parameterized by x. Okay. So, we'll take the vi's to be iid uh, measurement noises, and we'll let the density be p of z. So, we're just going to make this uh, scalar. It's easy to write, work out what this, what happens in the, uh, in, in the, in the uh, case when these are vector measurements. It's, it's, it's very easy to do. Okay. So, the density, I mean, of, of this, uh, clearly is simply, it, it's, uh, it, you take yi minus ai transpose x, and that, of course, um, has uh, this, this density, and they're independent. So the probability density, um, it, once, if you look, if you fix x, this is the parameter, it's just simply the product of these because they're independent samples. So you get this. That's the density. You take the log of that, that's the log likelihood function, and you get this thing here. So this is, the, is, is maximize. You know, I think I'm missing a, a sign or something here. Uh, no, I'm not. Everything's fine. Sorry. So your job, you take the log of this, it splits out, and you get the sum of the log of these probability densities, and your job is to maximize that. So for this to be a convex problem, in the general case, in x, remember yi are samples, they're data. Um, x are the variables here in an optimization problem. What you need to happen is you need p, in this case, because this appears in p, that's affine in x, um, you need p to be log concave. So in this case, because the parameter appears affinely in p, it's good enough for p to be log concave for this to be a convex problem. So let's look at some examples. Um, here's one. If the noise is Gaussian, so the density is just this, just, it's nothing but that, then the log likelihood function looks like this. It's a constant here, has nothing to do with x, and then minus this term, but if you look at that, it's a positive constant times nothing but sort of uh, an L2 residual, right? So nothing else. So in this case, the maximum likelihood estimate is the least squares solution. So now you know if you're doing least squares, you're actually doing maximum likelihood estimation with assuming that the noises are Gaussian. And in fact, it doesn't matter what the uh, variance is. Oh, sorry, all the noises have to have the same variance. If, you're doing, if you do maximum likelihood estimation and the noises of the different measurements have different variances, um, what does that translate to? Weighted. Yes, yeah, just weighted least squares, of course. It's diagonally weighted least squares. So that's what you do. So you can turn it around. And if you're doing diagonally weighted least squares, the truth is you're doing diagonally weighted least squares. If someone asks you, you could say, because I trust that measurement more than I trust that one or something like that. But if a statistician friend stops you and says, what are you doing? You say, I'm doing maximum likelihood estimation with the noises here having different variances. So that's, that's what that means. OK. That's fine. So now you know what least squares is. That's a beautiful statistical interpretation. Let's try Laplacian. So in Laplacian noise, uh, it it's, looks like this. It's exponential. And you actually can say a lot of things about this compared to a Gaussian. Um, the most important by far is that the tails are huge compared to a Gaussian. So e to the minus x squared is a whole lot smaller than e to the minus x when x is big. So this has huge, huge tails. I mean, obviously, the distributions with huger tails, however, those distributions are not log concave. But nevertheless, so that's the main difference here. If you do this and work out what, what this is, actually, all you're doing is just this. You, you just, you're just maximizing the sum of the log of the probability density. You get a constant. That's from this thing. And then over here, you get a positive constant times the L1 norm. So that's what you're doing. So if, you're doing, if you do L1 estimation, then what you're really doing is you're doing maximum likelihood estimation with Laplacian noise. So and this sort of makes sense, actually. This, this makes sense that this is why L1 estimation, and you know what L1 estimation does. What L1 estimation does is it, it allows you to have some large outliers where 
L2 estimation would never allow you to do that. Um, in return, in return, it will actually drive a lot of the smaller residuals uh, to zero, for example, to zero or small numbers. So, and now you can actually justify it statistically. You can say, well, you're really assuming that the noise, in this case, is more erratic. You're saying that, in fact, V does not fall off uh, like a Gaussian. If something falls off like a Gaussian, then being six sigma out is actually a very, very unlikely event. And you will, you will, cha you will change X considerably to avoid a point where you're, you're actually making the estimate that one of these things is six sigma out. Okay? If this is Laplacian, you are much more relaxed about that. It's a rare event, but it's not essentially, an, a, a, for all practical purposes, an impossible event. Um, and you'll actually allow a large outlier there. And so it all sort of makes perfect sense uh, statistically. As another example, um, you have uniform noise. So suppose the noise is just uniform, and, which is interesting because it basically says this noise here, um, it cannot be bigger than ab in absolute value than A. Absolutely cannot be. On the other hand, between minus A and A, you have absolutely no idea. You're just completely uh, uncommitted as to what its value is. It's not even centered at, it's, I mean, it's centered at zero, sorry. But it's not, it's not concentrated at zero. It's not more likely to be small than it is to be large. It's completely uniform in there. And sure enough, the log likelihood function is this. It's minus infinity unless all of these, all of these measurements are consistent sort of within A. They have to be. But then it's just a constant. So here, the log likelihood function actually takes on only two values. It's a constant, and it's minus infinity. So any point inside this polyhedron is a maximum likelihood estimate. Okay, So that's, the, uh, that, that's what happens here. Um, and of course, it's not unique, and so on and so forth. And if you, if you were to add to the uniform noise even the slightest tilt, uh, towards the center, you might get something else or something like that. So what this does is it allows you to um, translate or, or to talk statistically about, uh, about your fitting, your penalty function. So for example, let's, let's do one. Suppose I told you, suppose I'm, I'm doing fitting and I'm using a penalty function that looks like this. Okay, so it means I don't really, you know, if, you're, if your residual is within plus minus one, I don't care at all. I just, it's fine. I, I'm not even interested. Once it's between an absolute value less than one, it's fine. Then it grows linearly. And so I want to know, what's the statistical interpretation? This is maximum likelihood estimation. What noise density, what's the imputed noise density here? What would it be? You do, I mean, this is maximum likelihood estimation. So what? It, this corresponds exactly to maximum likelihood. What is it? Uh, it's uniform in the middle and uh, exponential tail in the, in the tail. That's exactly it. Yeah. So if you're doing dead zone linear penalty, which but you could do and just defend it on any, you know, on, on very simple grounds and say, well, look, if the residuals, le look, I can't even measure it that accurately. So if it's between plus and minus one, I don't even care. That's, that's fine. That's as good as my measurements are anyway. It makes no sense. And then you say, well, what about linear? Why not quadratic out here? Linear would say something like, well, sometimes there are some pretty large residuals uh, or pretty large uh, errors and things. And that's, so that, that's why I, I have this linear and not quadratic. OK? So that would be it. Um, the statistical interpretation is exactly this. You're, you're doing maximum likelihood estimation of y equals ax plus v. The vi's are iid, and they have a distribution that looks like this. Uh, that's supposed to be flat, by the way. No, I don't know. There, OK? So it's a, it's a uniform distribution between plus minus 1. And then it falls off. It has exponential tails outside. So that's, that's, that's what you're doing statistically. Makes perfect sense. Um, here, you'd adjust everything to have integral 1, of course. But that makes no difference, in fact. It's just, that's the shape of what you have. So if you do uniform, uh, if you do uniform, uh, oh, by the way, this is, of course, log concave because the Negative log of this is that. And in fact, that's how I got. I mean, that's how this, this came as by flipping this and then taking the exp. OK? So that's how that, how that works. So that's, that's all you do. So this is it. OK. 
Um, okay, so there's more on, on that, but that's something you, you can do in homework and reading and stuff like that to, to sort of see how that works. Um, and this is a very simple case. You can actually get to the case where you're estimating things like covariance matrices and things like that or, or other parameters, and it's actually more interesting, but that's the basic idea. Okay, let's look at another, uh, a, a, an example of something uh, different where the noises are not uh, additive at all. They enter in a complex, nonlinear way. Um, so we'll look at logistic regression as sort of a canonical example of this other, uh, of, of, a, of, a, of other classes of maximum likelihood estimation problems that are convex. So let's look at that. I have a random variable that's in, uh, in 0, 1. Um, and its distribution is the following. It has a logistic distribution. So the probability that y is 1 um, is e to the a transpose u plus b. It's e to a number divided by 1 plus e to the number. So that looks like uh, this, I guess, if you plot this uh, function like that. So that, that's 0. And what this says is, so actually, let's even take a look at this. If this for now, just treat this as a number, a transpose u plus b. Um, if this number is, uh, let's say, 0, it means that's sort of the equiprobable point. It says that the probability that y is 1 is half. If a transpose u plus b is like 2 or 3, then this is very likely, but not perfectly, certain to be 1. And if, if this number is, say, minus 2 or 3, this is also, uh, it's very likely to be 0, but not quite. So the transition zone is is where this number is, let's say, between plus minus 1. I mean, you can choose that number some other way. But roughly speaking, when, when this number is between plus, when this number is 0, that's the equiprobable point. When this number is between, I don't know, plus minus a half, plus minus 1, you know, you can throw in your favorite number in there. The probability is some, is some sort of number like, you know, 10%, 90, between, something like that. You could work it all out. When this number is things like 3 and 4, this is overwhelmingly probable to be 1 here. And if it's negative 3 or 4, it's overwhelmingly probable to be uh, 0. And that's, that's sort of a picture like this. Okay. Now, I guess uh, to the statistician, uh, here, A and B are, 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 uh, are parameters. So those are, those are just the parameters that generated the distribution. And so your, our job is going to be to estimate a, A, and B. Now, you actually, you can't estimate A and B if I just give you one sample from this. So you're going to be given multiple samples. In other words, I'll give you a bunch of samples, and for each sample, I'm going to give you U. So U here um, is, uh, these are often called explanatory variables. So they would be other things that you measure and associate with this sample. So this would be, for example, I don't know, if you're admitted to a hospital, this would be things like uh, blood pressure, weight, uh, blood gas concentrations, all things like this. And this could maybe be uh, if, you, uh, if you died or something like that, right? So that would be that. So yeah, hopefully things will end up over here. All right? So that's it. All right? So um, OK. So that's, uh, that's what this is. So these are explanatory variables. And what you want to estimate are the parameters A and B that parameterize this distribution. OK. So what we'll do is we're given a bunch of samples, and a sample looks like this. It's a pair, a uh, ui and a yi here. Uh, this is from, these are people who checked in, and this is uh, what happened to them. I guess in this case, zero being the good outcome. Well, we have to decide, but we'll make zero the good outcome. Um, so you get, a, you get a past data, like from last year. You get this data. You get a couple of hundred of these or something like that. And actually, let's even just talk about what, what you do with this. Um, we're actually going to fit uh, a and B. So we're going to do a maximum likelihood estimation of the parameters A and B. Um, by the way, once we have them, um, we can do interesting things. Uh, because someone can come tomor arrive tomorrow at the hospital, we can evaluate their U, evaluate this. And for example, if this turns out to be plus 3, that's not good for them. Um, if it's minus 3, I guess we can reassure them or something like that. That's uh, OK. All right. So this is, this is the idea. Now, how do, you, how do you do this if you want to work out what the log Likelihood is actually it's nothing but the, prob the, the, the likelihood function is the product of these things, because you're, we're assuming these are independent samples from, the, from, this from a logistic distribution. So you, you take the product of these, if you take, which is this, 
And what we've done is we've simply reordered the samples so that the first K ones were the ones, I guess, who died in this case, and the last um, M minus K plus one or something like that, whatever this is, um, are the ones uh, who didn't. So that's, you just reorder them. And in that case, you get the, I mean, you just take out the, you just multiply all this out. You can see that in the denominator, you always get this thing. That's for all of them. And the numerator, you take this, and you take the log of this, and this thing is the log of the product of the x. That comes out here as this affine term. And this one over here is minus log sum x. Now, of course, log, well, uh, by the way, why did I call this log sum x? I'm going fast now, but someone want to justify? How, how did I know just immediately that this thing was convex? Oh. What is it? It's what? A log of sum of integrals. Yeah, but there's a one there. That's one is x above zero. This is this is the log of e to the zero plus e to the a transpose u i plus b like that. Okay, so it's log sum x. It's the two term log sum x called with zero comma a transpose u i plus b. Okay. So this is convex in this argument, that's affine, this whole thing is convex. And with a minus sign, it's concave. So this is, this is, this is concave, okay? So that's the picture. Uh, by the way, if you want, you can actually draw this function as a function of ai transpose u plus bi. That would be called the logistic, well, if I put a negative sign here, which I haven't done yet, it would be called the logistic loss uh, function. And, and, and it, would be, it would be something like this. I, I wonder if I can get it right. Let's see, which do you want? If this is small, uh, then that is, uh, that's about zero, and it's that. So I think it looks like that, that zero. I may have gotten that right. If it doesn't look like this, then flip it over. And if that doesn't work, flip it this way. <laughs> and if that doesn't work, flip it this way again. So in one of those orientations with some number of minus signs and so on, the logist I guess actually people do logistic loss, they refer to it as, as, as this. It's a function that looks like that. Actually, this gets linear in this case, approximately linear. So anyway, but this is something to be maximized. Yeah. Uh, but is, is this covered in, uh, I know a bunch of you've taken 229, CS 229, is this there? Come on. Where is, is, uh, is logistic regression covered in? It's it is. Good. It's got to be. Yeah, what? Yeah. It is. Okay. All right. So. All right. So here's just an example. It's a it's super simple example. Uh, this is as as with most examples that you can show uh, on a slide. Uh, there are examples of what uh, there, there are examples where you definitely did not need any advanced theory to figure out how these things work. Okay. So. If, in fact, there's only one explanatory variable, uh, which is here, u, and then a bunch of outcomes here, then you definitely don't need anything advanced. I mean, just look at the data with your eye. So that's not the point of this. Um, I'll give you some examples of, of, of where logistic regression works, um, where it's, we're not talking what you do with your eye. So here's a whole bunch of data. It's, about, it's 50 measurements. And each, each measurement consists of this. It's a value of u here, and then it's a, uh, it's a one or zero. So that's, that's all it is. I mean, it, this could be anything. Um, all right. So, and you can see roughly uh, the following, that when u is larger, uh, you, there, you get more ones. I mean, you can see that because there's a sort of a concentration up here and fewer down here. And you can see that if u is smaller, uh, there's, there's fewer, there, you're more likely to be zero. Okay. But you can see there's lots of exceptions. Here's somebody with a very low U that turned out to be one. Here's someone with a very high U that turned out to be zero. Okay? So, oh, I should, uh, I should mention one thing. What do you, well, okay, let's, uh, what this shows is, is uh, A and B have been estimated. Now, a and B do nothing but control what here in the logistic distribution? B controls the, 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 uh, the point where this is neutral, and A controls the spread. It's the width of the transition zone. So A controls 
how, how stretched out this thing is, and B controls sort of where it is. And you can see that it has lined up, you know, about at, at what would be a very good decision point if you were forced to make a hard, if you were forced to make a hard classifier here. It's lined up uh, quite well as something that, you know, approximately separates, not perfectly, but approximately separates these cases from these. And this, and this spread here tells you roughly where the how much indecision there is. Okay? Let me ask you a couple of questions here. What do you imagine would happen um, if the data had looked like this? What if there were none there and there were none there? Okay? So basically there's this data and there's this data. What do you think? What do you think the logic first of all, what do you think? First of all, let's just talk informally here about what, what you think the logistic estimate is going to, the logistic maximum likelihood fit is going to be. Just draw a picture. What do you think? What's it going to look like? I mean, like this? No. It's going to be much sharper. In fact, it's going to be infinitely sharp. It's going to basically look like this. It's going to be a, a perfect thing like that, right? And, if, and the truth is, this thing can actually move left or right. It makes absolutely no difference. So the point is, if actually, if the data here is actually linearly separable, right, if there's a perfect classifier, um, that corresponds exactly to the logistic regression problem being unbounded. If you're doing maximization, it's unbounded above. Okay? So unboundedness above of the log likelihood, it means you get an estimate. It basically means you can make the log likelihood function as, as large as you want. Okay? And that corresponds to uh, this perfect separation like this. Okay? So, I mean, you, you have to check me on, on, on this. Um, so this is the, okay. So uh, what would be uses for this? I am not quite sure, but I believe actually some of the best spam filters uh, are, are, are done using logistic regression. I'm not, it's, you hear both things. It's something called support vector machine, which we'll see very shortly, and uh, logistic regression. So my guess, I think it's, it's both. So that's how that works. There, of course, the dimensions are very different. They're not one, right? You've got like a couple, you've got thousands and thousands of features and things like that, and you're estimating over very, very large data sets. Okay. Does this make sense? So this is an example where it's, it's, uh, it's, not, line it's, it's not linear remotely, um, obviously. I mean, this here, it enters in a very, very complicated way. Uh, the if you like to think of this as a measurement or an outcome, works this way. Um, by the way, I should mention to those of you in areas like signal processing and things like that, you might think, well, this doesn't have anything to do with me. Um, actually, I beg to differ. Uh, this is a one-bit measurement. Okay? So this is exactly, uh, well, with a particular distribution. Um, you change the distribution at something else. So, you, you will, if you do signal processing with low bit rate measurements, including, for example, single bit measurements, you will exactly get problems like this. Not quite this one. Uh, if it's Gaussian and then you take a sign, you're actually going to get, um, it's called pro-bit regre uh, pro regression. And you get a different function here. But it's the same, everything otherwise is kind of the same. Okay? So, okay. So that was our, our whirlwind tour of a more complex parameter estimation, a maximum likelihood estima estimation problem. So, okay. Um, oh, and let me mention, actually, with this one, I can actually mention some of the cases where, uh, the canonical cases where you get non-convex problems. And this, you probably look at in machine learning and other applied classes and things like that. Um, what would happen is you'd get, a, you'd get a bunch of data samples like this, but for some of the samples, some, of the U, some components of the UIs would be missing. That's the missing data problem. And there, it's not, the resulting problem is not convex. Okay? There's some very, very good heuristics that you can imagine, um, like assuming a value of u, carrying out the regression, then going back, uh, plugging in the most uh, likely value, you know, estimating u and alternating between these two, and these are all schemes that, that are used and so on. But, okay. Now we're going to look at... Um, Hypothesis testing. So how does hypothesis testing work? It works like this. Um, and this is just, we go back to the simplest possible case. You can get very complicated other cases. 
I like multiple hypotheses, not just one, but multiple ones. Uh, sorry, two, but uh, sorry, this, the single hypothesis testing case is actually quite simple. Um, but anyway, so we'll go, we'll go to the, the simplest one. This is where you have two. And we'll just take a random variable on uh, the letters one through M. So just very, very simple random variable. And <clears throat> what's going to happen is either uh, a sample, which is literally, it's just an integer between one and N. It was either generated by the distrib by a distrib distribution p or the distribution q. So these are these are non-negative numbers that add up to one. They're just vectors, actually, the p and q, the distribution because we have a finite set here. So that's the question. I give you a sample, and you I give you a sample, or I give you a couple samples, or something like that, and your job is to estimate was it this distribution or this one. Now, of course, this could be very easy. Um, for example, if x turns out to be 1, and this is, this is, I mean, kind of intuitive, and p1 is 0.9, and q1 is 0 0.002, right, then it is, it's just intuitively clear, it's quite clear, it, it's, it's a very good guess, by the way, not a perfect guess, but a very good guess, that in fact, x came from this dis the distribution p and not q, okay? So that's roughly, I mean, it, 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 it's, it's not that unobvious, you know, what to do here. As in these other things, it's not that it's intuitively unobvious. The question is, how exactly do you estimate, and how do you make a better estimator than, than an intuitive one? So we'll look at the idea of a randomized detector. So a randomized detector looks like this. It's a 2 by n matrix, so it looks like this. And what it means is this. Each column is actually a probability distribution on, on the two outcomes, like hypothesis 1 and hypothesis 2. Okay? And it says that if this, if this is the outcome that occurs, you should guess 1 with this probability or guess 2 with this probability. So that's the idea. Now, of course, often these things look like that, okay? Something like that. What this says is if this is what you observe in X, you simply guess it came from 1. If this, is, if this is what actually observed, you guess it came from hypothesis 2 or Q, okay? So if, you, if these are 0, 1 entries, um, it's, a, it's a deterministic detector. And a deterministic detector is silly. It just means basically you have partitioned X, the outcome space, into two groups where if the outcome is in one set, you declare that you guess it's hypothesis 1. If it's in the complement, you say it was hypothesis 2. I mean, that sort of makes sense. Um, however, you can have something like this, like that. You can have, you can have something weird like that. That means if, the, if this is the outcome observed, you then go off and you toss a coin. And with 80% probability, you guess that it was hypothesis 1. And with 20% probability, you guess it's hypothesis 2. Now, by the way, this is sort of like randomized algorithms in computer science. It, this just looks weird. Like, why on earth, if you're trying to make an intelligent statement or guess what happened. It doesn't seem like gambling on, on your own uh, is actually going to help anything. I mean, why on earth would you say, oh, tell me what happened? You go, excuse me for a minute, and get out a coin and flip it. It just doesn't look, just something doesn't make sense. Which is kind of like in a randomized algorithm, right? When, when someone says, here's my problem instance. Is, I'm talking about now in computer science, and you say, how do you solve it? And you go, um, hang on just a minute. And you get out the coin and you start flipping it. And you say, what, what are you doing? And, and you say, no, I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to solve your problem. You say, my problem has no probability in it. I gave you a, a problem instance. Please give me the answer. And you go, hey, hey, back off. Hang on. And you keep flipping the coin. It just looks, you know what I'm saying? I mean, after you get used to this intellectually, it's OK. But at first, it looks very odd. So the idea of having a deterministic detector, I mean, also, it, it's weird because you say, hey, you know, uh, output three happened, and you go, yeah, sure, that came from prop that came from uh, hypothesis one. And then the next day you say output three happened, and you go, yep, that was hypothesis two. Uh, so this looks uh, very inconsistent and strange. Um, actually, we're going to soon see what a randomized detector can do for you. I mean, it's still weird. I guess it's like I don't know. If you're in physics, you have to at some someday you have to either come to some, you have to some to come equilibrium, for example, with like quantum mechanics and things like that. Does it make any sense? And same with these, so, or not. But then you just know it's an unresolved uh, intellectual issue. Okay, so this is what a detector matrix is. Uh, 
and it, it describes a randomized uh, uh, detector. Uh, if you, and if you're uncomfortable with that, you just make it all zero, one matrix. Uh, of course, this is, there's a one in each column, and this becomes an encoding of a partition of the outcome space. Okay, now, if I simply multiply this matrix uh, T by P and Q, so if I take T and then I multiply by uh, P, Q, like this, uh, that's, that's lined up like this, then I get four probabilities here, and they're actually quite interesting. So I'll tell you what, what they are. Um, and I guess we should start with, uh, well, I don't know, we could start with the, the one, one entry. The one, one entry is the probability that you guess hypothesis one is correct when in fact the, dis the, the, the sample was generated from hypothesis one. So this entry is a good entry. Uh, sorry, in the, well, sorry it's, it's an entry that you want near one. Actually, if it were one, it would mean that you would be absolutely infall infallible. Uh, you could never, this entry, let's go down and look at this one. Uh, this entry is, that's the probability that you guess hypothesis two when X is generated uh, by distribution one. Okay, so that's the, uh, this, this is a false positive. We're taking, we're taking, um, I guess, hypothesis two to be positive. Okay, so that's a false positive. Now, we'll, we'll get to that. This one, this 2-2 two, two entry, so these two add up to one. I mean, they're like a conditional distribution, in fact. I mean, they're conditional probabilities. This entry is the probability that you were, that in fact the distribution was generated by hypothesis, by distribution two, and you guessed correctly distribution two. So that's this one. Again, that's something you want one. And this is, so these are the ones you want small, uh, are these off diagonals. It's probability of false positive, probability of false negative, and you want those small. Um, so in fact, what you really have here is a bicriterion problem, because what you'd really like well, of course, you'd really like this matrix to be the identity matrix. That means you're absolutely infallible. That means whenever distribution, it comes from distribution one, you correctly estimate distribution one and so on. You make no mistakes of any kind, no false positives, no, no false negatives. Um, but you really have, in general, you have a trade-off between these two uh, false alarm probabilities. Okay? And I, I guess there's lots of names for this trade-off. I actually don't know what it's called in statistics. I know what it's called in signal processing. It's called the ROC which is the receiver operating characteristic, but which goes back to like World War II or something like that. What, what's it called in statistics? Really? Maybe it came from you guys. <laughs> Who knows? Doesn't sound like it to me, but anyway. Uh, okay, so, all right, so this is, the, that's the problem you want to, and, uh, and we can actually talk about some of the uh, extreme points. Um, let's see, how small could I make the probability of false positive uh, be? And how might I do that? How small can I make the false probability, uh, the probability of a false positive? I can make it zero. How? Yeah, you just guess one no matter what happens. Then you, then in that case, you will never be accused of having guessed two when in fact one generated the sample, okay? So that, by the way, that scheme also has another huge advantage, which is great simplicity. Uh, uh, you don't have to even, you know, you don't even have to listen to what happened to guess where it came from. So, and obviously I could make false negative zero as well by simply always saying it's, it's positive, you know, it, uh, you, all, all you do is you, is you just, you always guess it's, uh, sorry, guess it's negative, always, okay, just period. And I think we got it wrong. Uh, this was, sorry, this was, this, you hear, to make a, no, sorry, that's right. You guess one, here you guess two always. Okay. So, will, I mean, this is actually correctly viewed as a bicriterion problem. Okay? So it's a bi. Oh, and by the way, what happens if there's multiple hypotheses like 12? What happens if there's 12? Well, let's talk about it. Suppose it's 12. I mean, because this is not exactly complicated stuff. We're just multiplying matrices out. What happens in the case of 12 hypotheses? Hmm. Well, this would be a good homework problem or something like that. But um, um, so what, what happens? What happens? Yeah, you have a 12 by 12 matrix. And how many of these things, how many of these bad guys off the diagonal do you have? Uh, 144 minus 12, so 132. Yeah, but some of them are, aren't, oh, okay, that's fine, yeah. That, no, well, that, well that's, that's fine. 
Okay, yeah. So rough, you know, 70 or something like that, right? Okay, so we got, we got a bunch of them, right? And so now you have a big trade-off where, and you might, you might have strong concerns about, uh, you might have different concerns about guessing hypothesis, thir you know, hypothesis three, when in fact the truth is it's it's, the truth came from whatever, hypothesis two. And you might, that might be one you really care about making low or something. And you can imagine actually then it would get interesting. But we're just looking at it in a simple case. Okay, so you end up with this. It's a bi-criterion problem. You want to minimize these two, these two, uh, these two things. Subject to, uh, this just says the column sums in T are one, obviously. And this says that they're non-negative. So this is obvious. Um, by the way, notice that everything here is, uh, is linear. So if this is a bi-criterion LP. It, actually, it's a trivial bi-criterion LP. So let's scalarize it. So we put in a weight lambda. If you put in a weight lambda, you add this up. And this is, this is silly. That's a linear function of t, of the entries in t. It's extremely straightforward. Um, this says subject to that. It's not only, I mean, so this is one of those uh, linear programs, I guess, that one of those trivial linear programs that you can just directly solve. It's kind of obvious. It's, in fact, you can, you can optimize each column of t completely separately because that's linear and so it's separable in t. This is a sum of contributions from each column. The constraints on t are simply that each column is in the unit simplex. And then I think you just did a problem on that or you did one a while ago or something. Anyway. And it's extremely simple uh, how to choose. You simply choose this. Um, if p is bigger than lambda q, you choose uh, the first hypothesis. Um, the other way around, you, you choose this one. So you end up with a deterministic detector, and this is called a likelihood ratio, <clears throat> likelihood ratio test, because what you really do is you look at this, and you compare it to a threshold, and, and then you announce which was the, which was the um, then you guess which, which distribution it came from. Um, by the way, this extends to the idea of continuous distributions and things like that. So it's, and it's very old. It's from maybe e easily the 20s or something like that. Is that right? Roughly? Yeah, 20s, I'd say. Maybe you're even earlier, right? This is... I don't know. That's about right. 20s? Okay, let's just say the 20s, right? So, you know, and it goes back to... Um, so now you see you have a, a, a nice mathematical way to go back to the simple case, you just, you look, how do you guess which one it is? You, if, oh, by the way, if lambda's one, then you simply choose whichever one is the more likely. Um, by the way, we'll see what the lambda equals one means. Lambda equals one, well, you can tell me. What does lambda mean here? What, what is lambda equals one? Because a maximum likelihood test would simply choose whichever had the maximum likelihood. That corresponds exactly to lambda equals one. What's the meaning in the bi-criterion problem for lambda equals one? has a very specific meaning. What, what does it minimize? That minimizes something for false positives and false negatives. Maximum likelihood. What is it? What is it? Probability of error. The sum, yeah. Which is otherwise known as the... It, if you put a lambda, if lambda is one here, it means actually that you're minimizing the sum of this and this. But the sum of this and this has an interpretation. It's called being wrong, right? So you're minimi it's called an error. So you're minimizing the probability of error. That corresponds exactly to lambda equals one, okay? So, the, and by the way, this ties back to maximum like, this is sort of the justification for maximum likelihood. So you could say maximum like, a maximum likelihood detector, you would then argue, well, you'd argue and you'd be correct, uh, minimizes the probability of being wrong and you're neutral, you're absolutely, you, false positive has the same weight as false negative. Is a question? Yeah. For this, do we have to assume that there's kind of a, an equal likelihood of being distribution P and distribution Q? Nope. It's We're doing statistics. Okay, but I mean. You're not even allowed to say that in statistics. Okay. I mean, if there, if there are. If you're Bayesian. Yeah, if you're, no, if you're Bayesian, no, no, no. <laughs> We're not doing that right now. So, so that's, if you, if you say that in front of statisticians, be careful. <laughs> you, could act, you could be physically dangerous. Well, um, if there are some Bayesians around in the room with you and they're large, you're safe. Go ahead and say that. But watch out. Okay. So I guess it seems then that um, mm -hmm. if, we, if we get a data point and mm -hmm. there's a 
and we look at P and Q. And there's, right. a, there's a very small probability that that data point came from distribution P. A very large probability that it right. came from Q. But if we know that 90% of the time... Right. By the way, you're already using... Already, you've identified yourself as a Bayesian. And, and you'd be already in big trouble. Okay. Okay. But no, that's okay. okay I'll, I'll tell you in a minute. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, that's your, you're safe here. Okay. Don't try this over in certain parts of Sequoia. Okay. So may, don't try it. Okay. But go on. Okay. But anyway, if you then, um, if you know that 90% of the time it's distribution P, then even though it's a small probability that your outcome came from distribution P, right. the fact that distribution P is much more likely should probably like influence your choice. Absolutely. So actually, this is a very good point to, to say this. Um, so we're doing statistics. And st in statistics, there is no prior distribution. You can't say even something like this is more likely or, or what's the likelihood of it being this or that. You're just, you're just neutral. Okay. I'm, uh, by the way, I'm neutral on this. I'm not uh, partisan in any way on, on, on this or, or, and what are... Well, we have to be careful because a lot of people are machine learning in this room too, and I don't know where their sympathies lie. Uh, but um, so that so so uh, a pure statistician would never you, you're not even allowed to say something like what's this is a more probable out which which one is more probable. The minute you say that, um, now you're you're doing Bayesian uh, estimation. So um, now I should say should say this uh, that if you if you do Bayesian estimation. Then instead of maximum likelihood, you do something called MAP, which is maximum a posteriori probability. Okay, and then and it's of course quite sensible if you have some ideas about what which of these things. If I told you ahead of time, by the way, you could redo all of this, and it's very very easy in that case. Um, if you do things like saying, well, yeah, it could come from these two distributions, but in fact, with thirty percent chance, it comes from P and seventy from Q, and you could work out everything that would happen here, and you'd you'd want something called the max. Then you could actually talk about the probability of uh, the actual probability of being wrong, things like that. So that's that's it. Now the good news is this. Um, oh, by the way, we we could have done that earlier as well in maximum likelihood estimation. Like for example, here we could have done MAP. Um, all that happens is very cool. You add an extra term. So what is a log likelihood function or a likelihood function? A log likelihood function turns into a a log of a conditional density. Then you multiply by a pr the log of a prior density, and you get regularization terms here. So, so that's what you that's that's what would happen. So, uh, but you need to know, just socially speaking, that watch out, you're you're treading on very dangerous. Uh, just just saying things like that uh, can could get you in big trouble. What's that? I wasn't trying to start. No, I'm neutral. I'm totally neutral. But just you could say that in the wrong place and be very sorry. <laughs> um, so. The good news is from the convex optimization point of view, they all lead to, uh, so the way that would happen if I was being, if, if, I had some ba if I had some Bayesians coming on one direction, if I had Daphne Collar coming on one side, and who would be the most extreme one in statistics? Who would, who would, no, who? No. I, I, Trevor, you're not going to name I, a name. People are pretty flexible now. They're pretty flexible, yeah. Yeah, so, <laughs> that was the right answer, I, I so. Um, and I had uh, a, 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 a statistical uh, fundamentalist uh, coming in, a group of them coming in on, on the left. Um, I would, for, for us, it's very simple. It's the, it's the, you just add a term here, which we would just say, it's just regularization. It's regular, and they'd say, that's not regularization, that's the log of a prior. And I'd say, no, no, it's just regu this is just regularized maximum likelihood or everything like that. So. Anyway, so that actually, thanks for bringing that up because I just wanted to. I mean, actually, if you, I, I think in, if you read the, if you go to, to the book, it's, it's, uh, it's neutral and, uh, and I believe honest about what it says. It just says, if, if you choose to believe that you're getting a sample from a parameterized distribution and your job is to estimate the distribution, that's a statistician. That's statistics. You can do that. Bayesians are also statisticians. <laughs> are they? <laughs> well, you mean it's well, now you know who I hang out with, what they are. Bayesian. Okay, sorry. It's frequentist. Is the frequentist. Name. Okay, sorry. That's, that's, that's <laughs> what I'm going to say. Okay. Yeah. So I'm not totally up on the, the details of these various schisms, but I, I, I do know that there have been a lot of wars ab about it and, and a lot of bloodshed, actually, <laughs> over, over these, these issues. But, but for us, they're just all convex problems, and they're just innocent little extra terms that, that end up in here. 
So that was a very long answer to your question. But, but it's a good, uh, just as a matter of safety to know, um, asking that innocent question in the wrong place could get you into deep, deep trouble. So not really, but actually maybe it could come to that. Well, we won't go on. All right. So. All right, so let's look, at, let's look at some examples now. Oh, uh, we have our interpretation of, of maximum likelihood. Maximum likelihood says you scan, it, it, outcome three has occurred, you scan the two probability distributions, you go to outcome three, and you see which has the higher likelihood. That's a maximum likelihood detector. That corresponds exactly to lambda equals one. Lambda equals one corresponds precisely to saying that you treat false positives and false negatives equally. Okay? That's, that's, that's maximum likelihood. Um, that will minimize the sum of the two, so which is something like the probability of being wrong. Okay. Now, you could also do a minimax detector. Um, you could say, um, well, I want to minimize the maximum uh, of, of the two, of the two error probabilities. Um, now, this one, actually, of course, it translates to an LP immediately. Um, but this one, actually, generally speaking, uh, in fact, in the finite case, essentially always with uh, it always has a, um, a non-deterministic uh, solution. And so let's see what that is. Um, so here's an example where here's these two distributions, you know, and it's kind of, look, anybody can figure out what happens here. If it's outcome one, you should probably guess it came from P, you know, and if it's outcome uh, three, you should probably guess it came from Q. Everyone's going to agree on that, okay? And there's actually not much else here to do, right? There's two other outcomes. And, you know, obviously if it's outcome two, you should kind of lean towards saying it was two, but uh, you should uh, equivocate or something like that. Something <coughs> like that. Okay. Um, all right. So here's the ROC, or receiver operating characteristic, although it's generally drawn this way. And I don't know why, but anyway, it often is. So here are the two. Here's the probability of false positive, false negative. We've already talked about these things. Um, this one is the detector that simply, this says, uh, sorry, it, yeah, you have zero false negative. That means you just simply always say it's positive. Just pure, you just announce it's positive, and you can have zero probability of false negative. Here's the trade-off uh, curve here. And actually, it's ob of course, it's piecewise linear. I mean, that's obvious because you're, you know, you're minimizing a piecewise linear function over some linear inequality constraints. So this curve, it's, well, this, this region is polyhedral, and the vertices here correspond to different things. In fact, the, the vertices correspond to the three thresholds in lambda. Lambda is the slope here. And so as you vary lambda to get a trade-off curve, it's kind of boring because if lambda is smaller than this, you get that point. Um, as you increase lambda, you will click over to three, this point. And it's just some point. I mean, these are the deterministic detectors, one, two, three, and four. Um, as you increase lambda like this, it's always the same. Right at this point, you switch over to uh, a different threshold. Uh, then you keep going like this, and then eventually you get so high that the safest thing to do is simply to guess that nothing ever happened. Uh, and that way you will have zero false positive, always. Okay, so there's not many points on the trade-off curve. But the minimax one, that's very simple. It's the maximum of the two. And the level curves of the maximum, this, this, is, this dashed line here is equal is the line of equal false probability and false negatives. And you can see very clearly that uh, it's not a determinant. It's right in between these two, and it is not a deterministic detector. So if you want to have a detector here which minimizes the maximum probability of making either a false positive or a false negative, then you're going you're gonna to use a, uh, you're gonna have to use a detector, a, a non-deterministic, a randomized detector. Okay. Now, I mean, this is all kind of stupid looking cases like this. That's, that's fine. Um, but if you, want, if you want to make this non-trivial, it's very, very simple. You just imagine something with 12 outcomes and, and vectors which are, and probability distributions on 1,000 points. Okay? Very, very simple. And now you want to decide on a detector. And now you start throwing in insane things like uh, how much you care about guessing it's number seven when, in fact, the truth was number three. And you start throwing in uh, how much you care about all these things, and all of a sudden, it's not obvious exactly how to do this. Then when you solve an LP, you get something that, or an LP or whatever, it's, actually, it's always going to be an LP. When you solve an LP, you'll actually get a, a detector that will beat 
soundly beat, according to that measure, uh, whatever, whatever other, uh, whatever your criterion is. Okay, so that's the that's the picture. Okay, so that's uh, that's that. There's a lot more you can do with Minimax detector uh, uh, with uh, detectors here, um, and there's a couple more topics in the book, which which I you can you will read about. Okay. Now we're going to look at our, our, our last topic in this uh, Whirlwind Tours experiment design. Um, this is uh, quite useful, very useful, and I think not, not that well, in some fields it's not that well uh, diffused, no knowledge of experiment design. Um, even in areas where people actually often do uh, experiments and, and get uh, construct models from data and things like that. Um, Okay, so experiment design goes like, like this, um, we'll, and we'll talk about how, how it works. Um, we'll do the simplest case, which is just linear measurements like this, and we'll just say that the noises are IID N01. You can change all this, but let's, let's just do that. Well, the maximum likelihood or least squares estimate is just, it's just this. And the error um, has a, is, uh, is zero mean, that's x hat minus x is zero mean, and has a covariance matrix, which is, is this thing. So that's, that's the covariance. By the way here, the noises all have noise power 1, so the norm of A is something like a signal-to-noise ratio, and I'm, now I'm talking if you're in signal processing or communications. So that's because I just made the noises have uh, power 1. So if A is, is large, if the norm of A is large, that's a very good measurement. It's a high-quality measurement, it's a high signal-to-noise ratio. If the norm of A is small, if the norm of A is 0, that's a utterly useless measurement because it's just a sample from noise and it has nothing to do with X. Okay, so these are that's so so that's if you want to get a rough idea, larger A is larger signal to noise. That's what that's what norm of A is. It's literally the signal to noise, something like that ratio, because the noise power is one. Okay, all right, um, and I'm sort of assuming their uh, norm of X is on the order of one, but that with that assumption that just scales the signal to noise. It's still the case that if you double A, it's sort of twice as good from a noise point of view, uh, standard deviation anyway, as, as if you hadn't doubled A. Okay, now this is the error covariance and it's, it's a sum of diags inverse. That's very interesting. Okay, so we can say a lot of interesting things about this. The first is, um, if that matrix were singular, that would not be good, okay? And what that means is the matrix is singular, it means you basically you haven't taken a set of linearly independent, uh, you haven't taken enough measurements, basically. Sorry, measurements that span X, okay? So that would be the case there. So if you've taken enough measurements so that the measurement vectors span Rn, then that means this thing is, is non-singular. And then you take the inverse, and of course, that's, that's the error covariance. And now it's clear, yeah, now I'm going to be very rough here. To make this matrix, you want this matrix small. And we'll talk about what small can mean. It can mean lots of things. You want the matrix small. But roughly speaking, the first thing you want is you want what's inside it, since that's an inverse, to be big. Good. That corresponds perfectly. Because if A is big, if the A's are big, then that means you have high signal to noise ratio. And that makes this error covariance small. Now, the interesting thing is it's not scalar, it's actually a matrix inverse. Um, and that's very interesting because it means what the error covariance is, is not simply, it doesn't depend just on each, the, the individual A's. It's actually how they all go together. Okay? Oh, there's one exception. If the, A, if the AIs are mutually orthogonal, then this inverse, you can just do it, change coordinates and do it, uh, and, and they're, they're independent. And then, it make, then they don't interact in any way whatsoever. But in general, what, what this says is the following, is you take a bunch of measurements, those are characterized by A1, A2, A3, and so on, um, and then you calculate the error covariance, and the error covariance kind of depends on actually the, the geometry of the whole set of these things. I mean, this is kind of obvious, but that's, um, that's the idea. And for example, if you want to make a, 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 an error co a, a confidence ellipsoid, it would, be, it would, be de it would depend on, on this covariance thing. Okay, so experiment design is this. It says, I give you a palette of possible experiments you can carry out. So we'll call those V1 through VP. And these are just experiments you can carry out. And now your job is to choose, um, to choose some number of experiments 
that will make this error covariance matrix as small as possible. So another way to say that is you want, I give you a palette of possible experiments you can, you can, uh, you can choose. And the simplest thing would be I'd give you 50 possible measurements. And I say, you may choose 1,000 measurements from these 50. Okay? You can choose 1,000. And you want that choice of 1,000 of from those 50 to be mutually maximally informative. Because what's going to happen is you're going to take all those measurements together, you're going to blend them, do least squares, you get all the good blending that least squares is going to do. And together, they're going to give you an error covariance like that. So let's talk about some choices. Um, if someone said, well, sensor one has the highest signal to noise ratio, so I'm going to choose all 1,000 measurements to have the signal to noise ratio 10, because all these others have signal to noise ratio one. Any comments on that? Is it a good choice? If, 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 if uh, V1 has a signal to noise ratio of 10 and all the others have signal to noise ratio 1, then and there, you can choose any of them. So you can, is there any, why would you not always choose the first measurement? It's 10 times cleaner than any of the other measurements. So, what's the problem? Matrix is not inverted. Yeah, it, you do unbelievably badly here. Because if, if, a, if all the AIs are equal to V1, this thing is rank 1. And it is, not, it, it is by a long shot not invertible. Everybody see that? So the point is, you're going to be forced. You can't, it's not a, you can't do a greedy thing and just choose high quality measurements. It's actually something where you have to choose all of them together. Does this make sense? I mean, actually, if you're confused, it's probably because this is actually quite trivial and I'm just making it sound complicated. But anyway. Okay, that's, but I, I do want to point this out. Okay, so you can write this this way. It's a vector optimization problem over the positive semi-definite cone. And here's what it, it says. So obviously all the, it doesn't matter what order you choose the measurements in, that's clear, because all you're going to do is sum these dyads here. You just sum the dyads. So it doesn't matter which measurement I do first. What matters if I have a thousand measurements to take, I have a palette of 50 choices, what matters is how many measurements of type 1 do I take, how many of type 2, and so on. And we're going to call those, those MK. So MK is the number of measurements of, uh, of choice K I make. And so I get this problem here. Now the MKs are integers, um, and they have to be non-negative. And uh, yeah, and they add up to my budget. Now, by the way, this is just the simplest version. I could also put a cost on each measurement. I could not only put a palette of measurements in front of you, I could also put a price tag on every measurement. And you could have a budget in money or time. And, and you'd get a then this budget would be something different. I can add other constraints to this if I want. I can add a, a time, money, I can add all sorts of other constraints. This is just the simplest case where all the measurements are equal, you have a but, you, you're allowed to choose M of them. Okay, now, now this problem here if you just say experiment design, this is what experiment design is. It's this problem right here. Okay. And this problem in general is hard to solve. But there are some regimes where it's relatively easy to solve. Um, actually, uh, you actually, the feasible set is essentially the, the set of partitions of, of, of M. Um, and by the way, if M is really small, like three, then this is pretty easy to solve, or, or four, or something like that. Then this is easy to solve. Um, the other extreme was when M is very large. Because what you do is you rewrite this this way, and you let lambda k be mk over m. And this is, uh, this is now the fraction of the experiments, of the m total budget you're going to use, of which you will type, take experiment type, measurement type k. So this is this, this, uh, this fraction. OK. Now, I haven't changed anything here. Um, actually, the truth would be something like this. The real problem would have m lambda k is in z, like that. Okay, so this, this real problem, this is the problem that gets you back to that one. It says that the lambdas I choose have to be multiples of m is 1,000, they have to be multiples of 0 0.001, right? So I comment this out, because can't handle it, basically. So you comment this out, and you get, um, now you get something called, some people call it's the relaxed experiment design, because I've relaxed this constraint. Uh, you already know that because I, wait, is that on the current homework? I don't know because we're working on homeworks like one and two ahead. Are you doing something with a relaxation in Boolean variables now? Yeah. 
Okay, good. Then you know what relaxation is. Okay, so relaxation is commenting out the constraints that you can't handle. Um, that's really what it is. There was a question. Yeah. Yeah, I was wondering if you can't handle the first problem because it's not convex. Um, reason is like your M is not convex. The only problem, the only thing that's not convex is that. Therefore, you can't handle it. Well, you could, um, but not in right not right now in what we're doing uh, in, in in the class. Um, no, in gen in general, you can't. Um, so these problems can be very very difficult. Uh, I believe it is, but don't. Because it looks like knapsack. Yeah, I think I could make. I'm pretty sure I could make this NPR, but there'd be no. I'd go to Google and type. And I'd type. I'd type experiment design NP hard, and there'd probably be five papers uh, showing that versions of experiment design are NP hard. I'm guessing, but I, I actually I don't know. Just to make sure. Could we also get rid of that constraint if we could use like a stochastic experiment design? Yes. Okay. So that actually is an excellent question. And so let me explain how, how this works. When you do a relaxation, I mentioned this to you because you're doing one now. Okay. So the way you, you uh, deal with relaxation, it's a very good point, it's a good, good time to talk about it. I'll say more about it later in the class. But when you're doing a relaxation, now first let's talk about, let's say what the truth is. The truth is you have a constraint you can't handle and you just comment it out. It's kind of like the truth of why do you do least squares. You do least squares because you can and you know how to. That's why you do it, okay? Then you can construct all sorts of stories, which are, some of which are sort of true, not true, you know, and someone says, why are you doing this? You go, oh, everyone, why, well, maximum likelihood, uh, asymptotically, blah, 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 estimator, uh, Gaussian, blah, 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 and they say, is the noise really Gaussian? You go, yeah, yeah, sure it is, yeah. You know, anyway, you, you do it, so, also, by the way, if you repeat uh, those lame excuses often enough, you'll actually start to believe them. Right? So you'll actually, uh, it started off, it's just you couldn't handle it. But then what happens is after you've been very successful doing least squares for like 15 or 20 years, you actually start believing it, that, that things are, you know, anyway. All right. So, all right. So this is a great example. Um, you're doing experiment design. You can't handle this, so you simply comment it out, and you're going to solve this problem here. Now, by the way, uh, in this problem, you could get very close uh, because you could bound how, how far can you be off if m is a thousand, right? So the point is, if you solve this problem with lambda being just a real number, you know, these are numbers between zero and one. It's a probability distribution. Each such number is at most 0 0.0005 away from an integer multiple point zero zero one. So you could actually bound that, right, in this case. So you could say, you could, so you could actually, you don't have to fall back on some totally lame excuse and something like that. But the alternative is actually better because it un works universally. It was your suggestion, and it goes like this. When someone says, what are you doing? You say, well, I'm solving this problem here. And you go, y yeah, yeah, but th this thing has to be an integer multiple of, of m. Um, and you go, oh, no, no, that's very unsophisticated. I'm actually doing a, uh, what I'm really doing is it's, it's stochastic experiment. It's like randomized. Actually, it's exactly like randomized detector. And you go, no, this is very sophisticated. It's, it's, this is how... You know, this is like, it's, it's like a randomized uh, algorithm, randomized detector. This is much more sophisticated than just committing to 179 of type 1, 28 of type 2, and so on that add up to 1,000. You go, no, no, no. That's, uh, this is much more sophisticated. I'm, I'm, I'm coming up with a randomized experiment design, and I'm going to come up with a probability distribution on the possible measurements. And then what I will do is I will ask for a measure. Each time someone asks, uh, I'm, I'm, I can carry out a measurement, I'll flip a coin and do a randomized experiment, and I'll use those probabilities. Now, of course, this is totally lame, uh, this argument. But it often works. So I do recommend trying it um, when you relax something and see if you get away with it, because it just makes things easier. So, did I answer your question? Uh, yeah, but one other quick one. Can you do better like that? What? Uh, with using, this? Using stochastic design. Can you do better than the Gary deterministic? Uh, can you do better? Uh, oh, yes, because you've removed a constraint. So you always do better in some sense, right? I mean, the problem, the only problem with solving this problem and not the original one is when someone comes along and says, yeah, but I have a thousand measurements. You got to come up with, come up with some numbers that add up to a thousand. And you go, yeah, well, 
187.22. And they go, what does that mean? I can't do you know, 87.22 experiments of type 1. I can do 187 or 188. Which is it? So that's the, that, that's the problem. And you go, no, but the 22 is more sophisticated because see, if you had to do 100,000, you'd be doing 18722 or something like that. So anyway, yeah, I mean, don't. In this, in this case, if m is large, you can bound how far off you can be, and it's not a big deal. In the Boolean case that you're doing right now, by the way, it's, in those, it's often not the case that you can bound how far you're off. Okay, so, okay. All right, so this is the problem. Um, uh, and by the way, it works, these things work really, really well. Um, I should also add the same thing you're doing in your homework now or will, are doing or will be doing shortly. The same methods work for experiment design. They work unbelievably well. So if you were to, if someone actually said, choose a thousand experiments to carry out from this palette of 20, you'd solve this problem, you'd get some lambdas, you'd just round them to numbers. Like you'd say, okay, 187 of the first one. And by the way, that would be a valid choice of experiment design, right? And it would have a certain value of E, which is a covariance matrix, okay? The relaxation gives you a lower bound. And then you'd say, someone could say, is that the optimal? And you could say, then you could honestly say, don't know. But I can't be more than 0.01% off. So it's good enough. So that, the same thing. You only know what I'm talking about if you've started on the homework. So, which is maybe not very many people, but anyway. We'll just move on. Okay, so there's the other question is how do you scalarize the, 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 the fact that it's a vector problem? So I mean, but it's more than a, well, it is a vector problem. Um, it's, it's covariance matrices. And by the way, in experiment design, you get interesting stuff and it's just what you think. I mean, basically what happens is this. I'll just draw a confidence ellipsoid. You make one experiment design and you might get this confidence ellipsoid. Okay, you choose another blend of experiments uh, well, if you choose another blend of experiments and you get this, it's very simple. The second was a better set of, was a better choice than the first, okay? The period. That's, this is the clear, unam uh, unambiguous section. But in fact, the way it really works is something like this. You choose one set of experiments and you get that as your confidence ellipsoid. And you choose another set of experiments and you get this, okay? And now you can say, which suite of, which experiment design is better? And the answer is it means, the, I mean, it's total nonsense. It's a, it's a multi-criterion problem. Now, by the way, if you're estimating x1, which one is better? Two. Obviously, the second one is better, right? If, for some reason, you wanted to estimate uh, something along this axis, obviously, ooh, sorry, <clears throat> that axis, then one would be better, okay? That's it. So you have to scalarize this, and there's lots of ways to scalarize it. And each way to scalarize it, by the way, ends up with a name of experiment design. The most common one by far, multiple, many books written on it, is de-optimal experiment design. I'm guessing D comes from determinant, but honestly, I don't know. So the de-optimal experiment design, you minimize the log debt of the inverse, or you maximize the determinant of the covariance matrix. Okay, so that's what you, that's what you do. As a beautiful interpretation of the confidence ellipsoids, you are minimizing the volume of the confidence ellipsoid. Okay, so that's, uh, that, that's the way, uh, th that, that would be the, the geometric interpretation. Um, there's others, um, if you put a trace, if you minimize the trace of this, which by the way has another beautiful interpretation. Um, the trace, by the way, is the uh, expected, is this. It's the expected value of x hat minus x true norm squared. So if you minimize the trace, and that's called a optimal design. Is, is the other one. And there's others, there's e-optimal design, and they go on and on. Okay, so it's clearly, uh, I mean, it's a convex problem because we're, we're doing relaxed experiment design. It's a convex problem. You know what, we should do, let's, we should just do a homework problem on that. Now that they know what relaxations are. Just super simple one. Sorry, we're, we're way, we're behind on that one. We should do that, where you get the bound and then you do the design. Okay, we'll, we'll do that. Um, so. Here, uh, actually, I think I'll, 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 I'll quit here, but just look, we'll look at an example um, just to see how this uh, works, and then I'll, I'll, I'll talk about this last business. So here's some possible experiments that you can carry out. 
Um, so these are the A's. So basically what it says is you're going to measure, uh, you're actually going to make a linear measurement. Now notice that these things are farther out. They have a larger magnitude than these. That means that this is a set of sensors here that have higher signal to noise ratio than these, uh, than these measurements. Okay? Now, it, it should be kind of obvious what you really want to do, if possible, is to have high signal to noise ratio measurements which are orthogonal. Because if, if they're orthogonal, it turns out it's going to, when you do the inverse, the condition number is small and big will translate to big when, to small when you invert the matrix and so on. Um, and so, sure enough, I think we had something like uh, 20 possible exper the palette of experiments offered was 20. Two were selected. And the two that select were selected make tons of sense. Um, didn't select any of these because these, these measurements kind of do the same thing, but with a better signal to noise ratio. So these were opted for, number one. Number two, it shows these ones that sort of were farthest apart from each other, the measurements that were farther apart from each other. By the way, if you do um, things like GPS and stuff like that, these, these things will make perfect sense to you. Right, this, these are them. It says you want to take measurements. In fact, you'd even call this like a, you know geometric gain or something like that is what you'd call this. So this is this is what happened. So you know, obviously in this case, you did not need to solve a convex problem to be told that you should take high signal to noise ratio measurements instead of low ones, and you should, if possible, take ones that are nearly orthogonal. You don't need that. Trust me, you have a problem where you're estimating. 50 variables or 10 even, and you have 100 possible measurements, there is absolutely no way you can intuit what the correct mixture of what the right experiment design is. And the result can be very, very good. So, but anyway, I thought we already decided. You, you'll find out. Well, you'll, you'll do one. Okay, so we'll quit here. <laughs>